Welcome to MrClef.com's review of continuity and change, compare and contrast, and causation. So on this review page, your AP US history cram page, which is also good for the SAT subject test, you'll see a whole lot of stuff. The terms will all go to flashcards with uh, usually there's a video on them. And if you keep scrolling down here, you'll see something about the historical skills here of continuity and change, compare and contrast, and cause and effect. I'm going to take you through uh, PowerPoint, which will also have some examples of turning points. And of course, pause it at any point if you just want to look at it. The idea here is to understand the skill as much as the history, because when you're making a thesis, you want to make sure you always go back to the skill that they're looking for. So let's go take a look. So in terms of cause and effect, you want to talk about both short-term and long-term causes. You don't want to just talk about one or the other because it shows that you have a deeper level of analysis. In terms of the causes of the Civil War, yes, you have all of the things on the left, all of that stuff, the sectionalism and slavery and all the compromise, Missouri Compromise, et cetera, uh, agriculture, and Dred Scott, and all this stuff that was going on and brewing. However, it's not until the election of Abraham Lincoln that you're going to have secession, and it's not until Fort Sumter that you're going to have the war. In terms of effects, the short-term effects, yes, uh, you're going to see Reconstruction. You can consider that to be short-term or long-term, depending on when you're arguing and how you are arguing. However, all the stuff that came up afterwards, the Black Code, the amendments, the rise of the KKK, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, all of that is a short-term effect. Long-term, you're going to go deeper. You're going to go further. You're going to look at home rule, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, the Jim Crow. All of that stuff would be long-term. So if you had an essay that was looking at cause and effect, you could say, although there were the long-term and short-term causes, or you could have short-term causes of this and that, and long-term causes of this and that, there were the effects such as this and that. Do not just restate the prompt. Don't say, oh, there were causes and effects of the Civil War. That is not the thesis that they're looking for. We're looking for specifics in the thesis um, that you could show, if you could show short-term and long-term, that would just kind of make your essay much more analytical and impressive. <clears throat> Moving on to civil rights era. Yes, 1947 and 1970. What will be long-term causes? Well, you can see this brewing for a long time as well. Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, racism, Jim Crow, all of the stuff that we just kind of ended on the last slide. It continues to go uh, throughout the decades. However, it's not until you have the short-term causes, all that stuff with Martin Luther King, you have the Brown versus the Board of Education, Rosa Parks, the Little Rock Nine. Uh, sit-ins, all, all of those things are considered to be short-term. The short-term effects, yes, we get the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts. Those are huge. Those would be your, that would be your bread and butter if you were writing an essay on the short-term effects of the Civil Rights era, as well as you have the 24th Amendment getting rid of poll taxes. And um, if you look at the long-term effects, you can link it not only to the African-American community, but also to LGBT, AIM, okay, the uh, American Indian Movement, Chicano. Uh, equal hiring, equal pay, stuff that happened under Obama where he's going to get rid of um, don't ask, don't tell. You, you can utilize the things that happened in the 1960s to help argue stuff that happened after the 1960s. Hence why we have short term around the time and long term afterwards. Big one, the progressive era. Well, you want to start with the populace, looking at the long-term causes for the progressive era. Star 16, you can see that on my website. You have uh, the populist agenda. You have S, they want a direct election of senators. They wanted tax, uh, to tax income for the T, the Australian ballot for A, which is a secret ballot, and railroad regulation. The 16 is for the 16 to 1 ratio of silver to gold, which never happened and is not a part of the progressive era. Stuff that happened during the Gilded Age is also important to know. Uh, those are the, uh, the all the, the exploitation of the workers, the robber barons. That is what we're trying to clean up. The Progressive Era looks to for progress to clean up the abuses of the Gilded Age. If you're looking to link two things for continuity purposes, Seneca Falls, 1848, 19th Amendment comes way later, but you can see stuff that is causing um, long term, that is causing people to act in certain ways and causing them to seek reform. 
Short term, Teddy Roosevelt takes office in 1901 after the assassina assassination of McKinley. And then you get the muckrakers. Um, you have The Jungle, which is the easiest one to write about, Upton Sinclair. But also, of course, you have How the Other Half Lived by Jacob Rees. You have Ida Carbell with uh, Standard Oil, helping to break up Standard Oil. Um, you have Lincoln Steffens, and you have Ida B. Wells. You have, a, you have a whole list of muckrakers. That's short term. That's in the moment. Short term effects. Well, you got a lot of them. Progressive era. Look at all that stuff right there. Those are the major progressive era reforms. The FDA is, as like I said, easy to write about. The FTC, conservation, um, even the Red Scare, which is, you know, it's not relevant to all the legislation, but it is a short-term effect. And long-term effect, look at that link. Populism, to progressivism, to New Deal, to the Great Society, to Obamacare. We're talking about bureaucracy increasing in size and government trying to give back to the people to do uh, or to help out those in need, um, to also enhance voting rights and uh, rights of the consumer, et cetera. So those are your short-term, long-term causes. I mean, you could do this with a lot of different things. I just wanted to use these as ways so that students can understand really what, what does it mean, short-term, long-term. Um, when you see it in a grid like this, it's kind of helpful, I think. Uh, in terms of turning points, when we're looking at, uh, in terms of change for turning points, just some things to look at before and after. Declaration of Independence, well, beforehand we were under British control, and then afterwards you start to get, um, besides independence, the Declaration of Independence is going to give you enlightened you know, democracy. Um, that's certainly a change. Mexican-American War, the U.S. neutrality. Before that, now all of a sudden we are looking to gain territory and manifest destiny. Turning point for women's suffrage. Well, women could vote in certain states at first. However, uh, by 1920, women start to get political rights, and that gives them more freedom in terms of uh, when you get voting, and then you get economic rights, etc., as opposed to just being able to vote in certain states. And, of course, the French and Indian War, that's going to end salutary neglect. Salutary neglect is 1607 to roughly the French and Indian War, and then afterwards, the British are going to have that lineage of taxes. That is going to help get the ball rolling for independence. Some other ideas, turning points. The Civil Rights Act, of course, is a turning point. It's supposed to legally uh, end discrimination. Red Scott, that is a turning point because it's going to galvanize the abolition movement. Stonewall riots, that's going to be the beginning of the LGBT movement. Um, and eventually you're also going to see uh, the end of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, of uh, that's going to go to the Supreme Court as well as Don't Ask, Don't Tell is going to be re um, repealed by Obama. And the market revolution, there's a good one for you. Economics is regional. However, after the market revolution, we start to see factories emerge and you start to get the country connected into more of a modern industrialization. More turning points. Rhode Island is founded to get rid of the separate uh, to um, promote separation of church and state. House of Burgesses is going to give people representative democracy uh, power. And the Great Awakening is going to obviously be the religious revival circa 1740. The Second Great Awakening, um, this religious movement is going to lead to what I call the audit. These are the, um, the effects of the Second Great Awakening. Women's rights, uh, Seneca Falls. E for education with Horace Mann. Man, did he love education. A for abolition. U for utopian societies. Uh, D, Dorothea Dix is going to have for I, the insane asylum uh, reform, and T, temperance. Those are going to come out of the Second Great Awakening. More turning points. The Spanish-American War, America is going to become imperialistic. The Compromise of 1877, that's going to end Reconstruction and lead to home rule. And the Progressive Era and New Deal, well, that's going to be a turning point because now we have more of an interventionist government. Containment with the Cold War. That is going to be, uh, at first, remember, we had appeasement uh, in Europe. Before that, this is a big change in foreign policy as America now tries to stop the spread of communism. My gosh, there's more. Erie Canal uh, is going to turning point because now you're going to connect the whole country and get stuff from the Atlantic Ocean to Great Lakes. Marbury versus Madison, the beginning of judicial review. Columbian Exchange. That one, as you know, is going to lead to all these new different things coming in uh, to the new world. And the Monroe Doctrine is the United States using an international statement. We are we are being assertive um, with that statement to say that Europeans were not allowed to make new colonies in the Western Hemisphere. Whew, done with that. 
Compare and contrast. That's similarities and differences. So let's say you needed to come up with similarities and differences. Let's play the home game. Here, take a few minutes and fill this in. Wow, look what you did. Great. So if we're looking at similarities between Reconstruction and the Civil Rights era, um, we're both looking to expand rights. However, um, you're not only seeing them expand rights, you're also seeing resistance to Reconstruction, right? You're going to see marches in Selma for the Civil Rights era. You're going to see Congress battle the president, um, or Johnson at that um, during Reconstruction. You're going to see black codes to ignore Reconstruction. So there is going to be there is going to be a pushback to both movements. Differences, Reconstruction is going to be mostly African Americans, or predominantly, it's what it's going to be um, for the freed slaves. Civil Rights Act, though, is going to include women and other minority groups. Civil Rights era is going to have greater success. We know that Reconstruction could be debated. Uh, was it successful or was it a failure? Well, if it was so successful, why would you have Home Rule and Jim Crow and all those voting obstacles? Reconstruction is going to give us several amendments, whereas... The civil rights era is going to try for an amendment for women. It's going to fail. You're going to get equal rights amendment. It's going to fail. Um, however, there is one amendment, the 24th Amendment, which is going to end poll taxes. So you can argue that if you so choose. Antebellum and the progressive women. Take a minute. Take a good job. Women become politically active uh, at this time period uh, or both time periods. And it's going to also see a um, both movements be concerned with temperance as well as children's issues. Both are going to be affected by religion. One, you're going to have the Second Great Awakening for the antebellum. That's before the Civil War women, which we talked about before. And the social gospel movement is going to be uh, later on where churches and people are going to do chari um, use, utilize charity for um, flight of immigrants in big cities. You think of uh, Jane Addams and Hull House and settlement houses and the like. Antebellum is uh, going to be different also because abolition wouldn't be an issue for the progressive women. And progressive women are going to work alongside men. Um, they're going to be actually, you know, working in factories as opposed to the antebellum women. That would be um, less common. Progressive women are going to be concerned with uh, immigrants, like I said, settlement houses. And women are going to join unions. Some are going to be uh, the head of unions during the progressive era. And that certainly is a far cry from what was going on during the antebellum period. Rights in a time of war. Here's an interesting one. Take a second. And if you look at uh, John Adams, the Alien and Sedition Acts, okay, you have that. You also are going to have the Espionage and Sedition Acts of World War One. Okay, remember the Supreme Court saying if it's a clear and present danger, um, it, it you know the First Amendment can be suppressed at the time period. And uh, Lincoln suspends habeas corpus. So th th these are all very similar. And in, in, in a time of war, the the president, as we look at Executive Order nine zero six six with Japanese internment, and we know the Korematsu case is going to challenge that. In times of war, the Supreme Court said that, you know, civil liberties can be curbed. And the Patriot Act is after 9-11, which is going to allow the government to further their surveillance of, sus of suspected terrorists. So you walk in a fine line of what your rights are when you're in a time of war or conflict. Differences, well, um, what, of course, the Patriot Act is concerned with terrorism. The other ones might be specific to uh, internment or communism. So depending on the issue, there there are going to be striking differences. European settlement. Oh, this one, the kids, they, you go back to period one and you're like, oh, no, don't give me something on period one. Well, you don't have to choose that essay if, if, if it is one of the ones that you can choose. And a DBQ is not supposed to be from solely from period one. But if we're writing about it, nonetheless, um, there are similarities in, in the Spanish and the English. They're looking at mercantilism uh, for profit. They're both having Native American conflicts with Native Americans, and they're both trying to benefit the mother country. Of course, the Spanish are going to intermarry. They're going to start a mestizo culture. They're going to impose the encomienda, which is a human rights violation. The English are going to utilize indentured servants, and the English are predominantly Anglican, where the Spanish are Roman Catholic. You're looking at differences. And of course, we know the French are going to intermarry as well, and they are going to ally with the Native Americans under the fur trade. That's why it will be called the French and Indian War. Colonies are going to be different, the northern and southern colonies. Well, the similarities, again, Native American conflict, mercantilism, they're both going to have the beginnings of democracy. They're both going to, um, you have the Mayflower Compact in the north, you have the House of Burgesses in the south, you have the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut in the north, you have New England town meetings. 
And you're going to see some semblance of freedom of religion in Rhode Island under Roger Williams, the Holy Experiment of William Penn in Pennsylvania, and the Act of Toleration in Maryland. But there's differences in these colonies. The North is mostly for religious freedom, whereas the South is for economic reasons. The Virginia Company, remember, they're planning tobacco. There's going to be certain geographical differences. And Massachusetts would lean more towards independence with Virginia. Uh, or should I say, then Virginia at first, and eventually Virginia will, which is where George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are from, they will join the cause. Jefferson and Jackson. They are similar, and yet they are different. They're both for the common man, and they want to limit the powers of the wealthy elite. However, Jackson's the one who is going to enforce the tariff. After he vetoes the bank, he's going to enforce the tariff, which nearly leads to civil war. Jefferson is going to enforce the Embargo Act, which is going to go against big business that way um, by trying to keep us neutral in terms of our trade. Uh, he cuts off our trade to Europe, and that's going to be repealed later on. Jackson did not uh, uh, take in Texas as a state because he didn't want to rock the the slave, non-slave state. Um, you know, there's a balance there, whereas Jefferson gained territory with the Louisiana Purchase. So you see the differences. One didn't take in the state, one got uh, territory. Jackson fought the Supreme Court regarding Indian removal. I remember Worcester versus Georgia. Um, so that's uh, one of the things to talk about, you know, the differences between the two. And here's a great one. This was an essay uh, a few years back Maybe it was a short answer question. Hmm, the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. We know the Articles are weak. They're going to have all the problems. They're going to have all the, the problems. So the, the right side of this is really easy. The differences. The fact that the Constitution has a president, strong government, controls interstate commerce. The National Army, remember Shays Rebellion, and um, the Articles didn't have an army. The bicameral legislature, and um, as opposed to the you know unicameral. It's also easy to pass laws and amendments. However, the similarities, you might have to think more for that. We'll both have an amendment process. The articles are 13 of 13. Very difficult. Uh, both are a plan of government. Laws can be passed, and they can conduct foreign policy under the articles. I mean, that's where the Treaty of Paris came in. So you can make peace, you can make war under the Articles of Confederation. Regarding continuity and change, there are things that continue the same way, and there are also times when things change. Some issues will give you both. The Declaration of Independence gives you change in the sense that, yeah, you now have a new government and there's all that wonderful enlightenment thought, but there's still a continuity of inequality for our women and minorities. Continuity and change. Fourteenth Amendment, yes, it gives citizenship. That's change. However, there's still a continuity of denied rights through home rule uh, in Jim Crow is going to exist. Same with the Fifteenth Amendment. Yes, African Americans will get suffrage. But there's still a continuity of inequality through literacy tests, grandfather clauses, poll taxes, etc. Imperialism is going to be a change because now the United States is going to try to amass this world empire after the Spanish-American War. But there's still a continuity from earlier manifest destiny during the Mexican-American War. I've seen that um, on a, an essay before, you know, comparing and contrasting imperialism to the Mexican-American War, that time period there of Manifest Destiny. The 1960s counterculture, there's going to be a continuity there. Transcendentalism, going back to like the 1830s. Lost Generation of the 1920s. The beat mix of the 50s and the 60s. You have the hippies. They're all counterculturalists. They are against uh, the, the, the materialism. They're nonconformists. And um, that's going to be, we're going to see change, of course, here as the United States is going to go into the Vietnam War, so the hippies are going to be more relevant to that, whereas the beatniks are 1950s uh, against the conformity of the 50s. So there's differences in, in terms of, you can do even do a, a compare and contrast on this as well here. Civil rights, you're going to see a con continuity reconstruction to Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois into the civil rights era, and but there's also change. You're going to see uh, laws actually pass, and the Supreme Court will be on board with versus the Board of Education. That's going to be a big deal. The Supreme Court was not on board when you're talking about Plessy versus Ferguson. Containment. Here's an interesting one. A continuity. The Monroe Doctrine. American Statement. The Corollary. An American Statement. World War One and the Treaty of Versailles. This is the United States getting involved to make world policy. There's going to be change, though, in communism. The United States is really the head of that. You know, after World War II, the United States is going to be the leader of the world when it comes to containment. And the UN 
is going to be formed also, which has changed after World War II. Uh, you remember the United States does not join the League of Nations, and now the change is we are at the forefront, five, one of the five permanent powers regarding the UN. In terms of democracy, there's a continuity of democracy in the colonial period. The Zenger trials for freedom of the press, freedom of religion is going to exist. You're going to have a bicameral legislature. You're going to have a House of Burgesses. Um, the change is going to be that the United States is indeed the representative democracy that's going to come out of the Revolutionary War, which is a big deal uh, and a big experiment compared to other nations around the world that had monarchy. Feminism, there is going to be changes that are going to exist in the 1970s. You're going to have Title IX, the Equal Rights Amendment is going to fail. Betty Friedan is going to be the president of now. But there's still a continuity. People say there's a double standard, right? If you look at the uh, flapper. Uh, going back to the 1920s, they'll say, well, it's a double standard of the way a woman is supposed to act versus a man. And that double standard, uh, many of my students have argued, continues to today. And Republican motherhood here on the bottom here, this is a continuity of women being involved and women gaining rights. And, and of course, it's going to... Um, you're gonna, it's it's gonna ebb and flow. It's not gonna be linear. You're gonna have setbacks for women's rights at times. However, these are examples of women gaining um, at first Republican motherhood, more respect in society and contribution going into the modern era post World War II. Um, in terms of immigration and nativism, you have a continuity here of nativism, the Know Nothing Party, the KKK, the Quota Acts. People, we're going to see that immigrants are going to continually move to cities. They're going to be continually uh, in demand for industrial labor. But the change is who's coming over. New immigration is going to come from Eastern Europe, Southern Europe. Second wave is going to be more numerous the second time around. And that second wave is also going to be less skilled. I have a video on immigration distinguishing the two different waves of immigration. Usually it's a pretty easy essay. Kids like to write on that one. Gilded Age, a lot of change is going to take place in the Gilded Age. Sure, you're going to get the Pendleton Act to get away to patronage. You're going to have the Sherman Antitrust Act, the Interstate Commerce Act. Um, unions are going to be founded. However, let's be real, the continuity is going to continue. The exploitation, the rich over the poor, the trusts. Um, you're going to have municipal corruption in the cities under Boss Tweed. Despite the legislation, it's going to continue until the Gilded Age. Segregation, schools will be desegregated in 1954. That's a change. However, you're still going to have well, segregation in the restaurants. The Little Rock Nine. Also, you're going to see uh, uh, pro-segregationists, uh, political parties that are going to emerge. De facto segregation continues today. That's when people just segregate themselves, despite uh, what the Supreme Court says. So even though you're going to get rid of segregation, you're still going to see that segregation fight continue. In terms of government, here's a difference. The Constitution is going to bring changes to the Articles of Confederation. And there's still, even though you have the Constitution, there's still a continuity where you're going to have Enlightenment ideals, such as freedom of religion and property rights, etc., freedom of speech. So although you have the change to an Articles of Confederation and the Constitution, you're still having that sense of the ideas you know, going back to what limited the monarchy in the first place. The Great Migration is going to be a continuity of discrimination, which is going to be, uh, you know, they leave, the, the Great Migration is when African Americans leave the South and go to the North. There's going to continually be discrimination in the North as well. And the Great Migration, though, will, um, there are going to be changes in terms of the industrial jobs that are going to be experienced as opposed to being sharecropping. However, discrimination, like I said, prevails. John Marshall made the Supreme Court strong. And uh, there's still a, um, a, a continuity, though, of it not being respected. If you go back to Wissa versus Georgia, I'm just trying to give you a little John Marshall there. Korean Vietnam, it's going to be a change. We're going to see the domino theory and the U.S. applying containment to Asia. However, there's still a continuity of European containment and um, of, of being applied to Asia, that is, and a continuity of other um, examples of conflicts or policies that existed beforehand. Remember that in the Philippines, there's going to be an insurrection there after we take uh, take control. Boxer Rebellion um, and John Hayes' open-door policy as well um, to protect American trade in China. 
Here's a continuity of conservation. Teddy Roosevelt and the National Park System to the CCC of the New Deal to the recently Clean Water and Air Act, the Endangered Species Act. Um, remember Rachel Carson, um, who wrote Silent Spring, a very important book that seems to find its way on every social studies test these days. And the change is going to be modern environmentalism. People are very concerned about the environment and, of course, global warming. Some other ideas of continuity, just off the top of my head, a bunch of, you know, Red Scare is similar like to McCarthyism, right? The, the one of the progressive era that ends the progressive era. Here's civil rights. Um, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions is very similar to the South Carolina Exposition and Protest, the Alien and Sedition Acts. Here's, uh, we talked about this before, limiting rights in time of war. Trail of Tears, here's Native American um, discrimination. Populism to progressivism, we did this one before of a continuity of the government's getting bigger and uh, really doing more um, for um, to, to in terms of health care and other um, help out poverty. Scandals of presidents. And there's your Rachel Carson stuff I just I showed you about regarding conservation as far as more change. You're going to see indentured servants being replaced in terms of labor by slaves, yet they're still planting tobacco. Don't get confused. Cotton comes later. And the Stonewall riots, and, and, and this is for gay rights. You're going to see Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, be repealed uh, eventually. Uh, after, of course, it was passed, it would be repealed about 20 some odd years later. Salutary neglect is going to end, and there's a big change to the Stamp Act, etc. The Warren Court is going to change segregation. Uh, they're going to go, they're going to not only support integration, they're also going to extend rights to the accused in, in court cases such as Mapp versus Ohio. Um, and that, that was a Miranda with the case. And uh, the third one, they always go Gideon versus Wainwright. Those, those three cases usually go together. Articles of Confederation is going to be changed by the Constitution. And Shays Rebellion, where there was no army to put it down under the Articles of Confederation, the Whiskey Rebellion is going to prove that the United States with their army. A reminder that you can use this uh, AP U.S. History Review Sheet for not only the AP exam, but also the SAT subject test. It has just about, or hopefully it has everything that you need. Uh, timelines, uh, it's got some fun history music on there from the social studs. And if you click on any of these, they'll go to a flashcard, which will give you usually a video. Uh, this one does have a video and uh, it'll tell you all about the thing or the term that you're unsure about. Best of luck on your exam, everybody.